anyway, I just wanted to thank the organizers for inviting me. Anyway, I just wanted to thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, this has been a really stimulating conference and it's made me sorry that I didn't ever invest in learning German because there's clearly a lot of very interesting work going on here and, um, and my intervention will pick up on a lot of themes that have been raised both from the morning and this panel and, and so hopefully um, there'll be much to talk about. Uh, in 1994, Eric Hobsbawm published the short 20th century, and he starts out by commenting that it's as if the world is in the midst of a fog, a what he called the global fog, and that uh, people were certain that an era of history had ended, but other than that, they really were confused about what, where history was heading into the future. We're almost 20 years later, and there's still a great deal of uncertainty. And even since Hobsbawm wrote in 1994, there's been a whole set of wild swings, both in the nature of US power and the perception of US power in the world, as well as in the situation of social movements, including labor movements, third world movements, and the assessment of their uh, collective power. So we go from the 70s, which was uh, the 1970s, which was a deep crisis of uh, US power, the US state on a world scale, and uh, a deep crisis of US capital, to a beginning of a restoration around Reagan-Thatcher policies in the Reagan-Thatcher counter-revolution in the 80s. Then we get the high point, really, which is 1997, of the uh, East Asian financial crisis, when there's this almost uh, disgusting um, self-congratulation in the United States about being the world's only superpower, and you start to get down the road to the uh, Bush's project for a new American century. This conceit, this idea that in fact U.S. power had reached such a height that, uh, that a, a second American century could be contemplated. 2003-2008, um, this all starts to unravel, uh, with a, first with the uh, military debacle defeat in Iraq, um, and the ongoing mess in Afghanistan, the 2008 financial crisis. And by today, you know, there, there was more uh, talk about a deep crisis of the United States that by 2011 with um, the crisis in the Eurozone. There's also a general talk, uh, uh, quite widespread, about perhaps a, a general decline or relative decline of the West, a serious deep crisis of the West as a whole. Movements have had uh, a similar kind of swing, but mostly uh, mirror image. Uh, in the 70s, uh, national liberation movement, well, not so much national liberation, but there were str strong third world movements uh, uh, demanding a new international economic order, uh, labor movements in various places, including obviously in Western Europe, the United States were still strong, and then we had strong emerging labor movements in the countries that had grown rapidly in the, uh, industrialized rapidly in, in the 60s, 70s, 80s. So Brazil, South Africa, uh, Poland, um, South Korea, etc. But uh, then things started to collapse for labor uh, and for the third world, starting again in the 80s and by the 90s, um, I would say there was a general crisis of labor movements on a world scale, whereas in the 1980s and up to the early 90s, there was a crisis in the core, but there really was not a general worldwide crisis of labor. By the late 90s, um, people may be familiar with uh, the fact that in my book, Forces of Labor, uh, I use this, uh, uh, we did this data collection of all events of labor unrest from around the world from 1870 to 1995. Around 1995, just, you know, set aside doing the data collection because 
looking for events of labor unrest in the in, uh, global newspapers uh, was a bit like looking for needles in a haystack, and so it was very technically difficult to find a needle in a haystack and also morally discouraging process. Uh, uh, last summer, they were giving out a free copy of the Financial Times. May, May and June, I, I, was in, I went to South Korea and then I went to China, and they were handing out free copies of the Financial Times on the uh, airplane. And I pick up May 2010, I pick up the paper, and the entire front page of the Financial Times was uh, labor unrest and social movement protest all over uh, the world, except actually, except at the United States, except in the United States at that point. Um, but there was, on the front page, there were anti-austerity demonstrations in Greece and Spain. There was a general strike in South Africa. Um, there was uh, reports on uh, the unrest, including strong elements of labor unrest in Tunisia and Egypt. And there was, uh, very importantly, a big strike at the uh, automobile factories in China that was shutting down the Honda, uh, Honda, Honda's entire operations within China. It was a kind of parts factory strike that had ripple effects and shut down their assembly uh, position. And it was also leading to, to kind of a, 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 a wave of kind of copycat strikes and stuff. So, uh, so I was saying, oh, this is interesting. Maybe it's time to start up the data collection again, and I'm kind of trying, I'm working on, working out the technical problems. With doing that, I was also noticing that it was everywhere except the United States, and then shortly after that, there was Wisconsin, and then, of course, the Occupy Wall Street. So we don't know, we don't know what all of this adds up to, but it raises the question, are we in a moment of where there's something really uh, new and different happening, some kind of a turning point in terms of um, the ability of uh, unrest, mass unrest from below to push the direction of uh, social change. So, so um, I, I in, you know, in order to try and make sense of these wild shifts, like, so is this just like a momentary upsurge that in a few years is going to dissipate and be gone, or is there something long term here? Is the, is what it seems to be this rising power of China something that you know, in five years, we'll look at like the rise you know, th that it'll just everything will have fallen back. The, the world hierarchy will have fallen back to where it was before. So, uh, in order to make sense of this shifting the globe, what the Hobbsbaum's global fog in general, you know, what I've done and people I've been working with, we uh, try to compare the present with past analogous periods. Uh, and so try and see, in order to be able to see what's really new and what's not new and what are the kind of long-term patterns of, of change. And right now I'm working in two different types of comparisons. I'll probably, I can see the time going really fast, so I'll, um, I'll probably only have time to talk about the one, which is the crises, uh, which is a comparison of long centuries. Uh, and a second, which so it's a comparison of systemic cycles of accumulation or long centuries. I'm going to talk about it, so I won't say more about it at this point. And the other um, that I'm finding essential in order to be able to really think about what's going on now is also a comparison of crises within the long 20th century. So if we take the long 20th century, which is the period of rise and spread of U.S. world power, you know, from the late 19th century to the present, there's a crisis in the late 19th century, the crisis of the, the Great Depression of the late 19th century, crisis in the 1930s, 1970s, and today. And so thinking about uh, those four, and hopefully I'll, if I don't have time to talk about it in the presentation, maybe it can come up in the discussion. So, um, so what I am gonna focus on first is these uh, systemic cycles of accumulation which take a Braudelian uh, long durée view. So there's general agreement that one of the key characteristics of capitalism today is this financialization. Um, there is also a surprisingly wide amount of agreement that uh, the financialization of today has some similarities with financialization of the late 19th century. 
Bradell himself goes back and says that there have been a series of phases of financialization. So that financialization is not like a new, latest, highest stage or whatever, but that it's the end stage of a series of recurrent uh, material expansions. And so um, that we've had, uh, if you look at a world historical level, we've had four uh, major material expansions of capitalism, four phases of capitalism. I don't know, you know, some people put up on, on in this session different formulations. And that each one eventually leads to an overaccumulation crisis uh, where plowing back uh, investment into the same lines of production, whether it's textile factories in the 19th century or automobile factories in the 20th century, at a certain point there's an overaccumulation of capital and, 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 uh, and investors pull out of trade and production and move into uh, finance and speculation. And we end up, <clears throat> um, Giovanni Arrighi in the long 20th century systematized what in Braudel are kind of scattered observations to pose this theory of uh, four systemic cycles of accumulation, the, of capitalist history being characterized by four systemic cycles of accumulation, a general Isabirian one from the 15th to early 17th century, a Dutch one from the late, Dutch-led uh, cycle from the late 16th to the late 18th century, British-led cycle from the mid 18th to the early 20th century, and a US-led cycle beginning in the late 19th century. Now, one thing um, that, from the dates that I was giving you for these different cycles, it's clear that they, they overlap, and that's what this fourth, the, the first just picture I was showing here, because it sort of helps me to think about uh, where we are now and uh, in terms of the long durée of capitalist history. And what this, these overlapping systemic cycles of accumulation, if we conceptualize them as overlapping S-curves, um, this is a Gerhard Mensch growth model, that um, what we experience is as the decay of one cycle overlaps in time with the interstitial emergence of something new. So this combination, simultaneous combination of decay of the old, interstitial emergence of the new, is part of what creates the sense of, of confusion about where we're at. Um, and, and in some ways, if you want, um, the, you can think of the 1970s uh, as being point A on the, one of those curves, where the, uh, I guess, let's call it point A on the two, curve number two. Yes, well, yeah. Um, and where, the overaccumulation crisis set in and capital began to pull out of trade and production and specialize in finance. And so you have the takeoff of financialization. The same time as you have the takeoff of financialization, you have the beginning of the interstitial emergence of something new. So the British financialization of the late 19th century was also the beginning emergence of uh, Fordism, within the US, the, the, the emergence of uh, multi-layered subcontract, excuse me, of vertical integrated multinational corporations, of a change in the organizational structure of capitalism, a change in the social structure of capitalism. Um, and, uh, and today, it raises a question, are we in the midst of a similar kind of interstitial emergence of something uh, new. Now, what we, uh, th and this is a piece actually, so now I'm, I'm speaking from a piece that was co-authored with Giovanni Arrighi. Um, what we did was summarize uh, a set of uh, recurrences and then evolutionary patterns. So one of the purposes of this kind of comparison is not to say, oh, capitalism is just an endless cycle of the same. Not at all. The idea is to identify what's similar in order to be able then to identify the specificity of the period we're living in. And so there are um, certain kinds of similarities that we can identify across these four systemic cycles of accumulation, and particularly 
uh, in comparing the phases of financialization, which are these transition periods. So in all cases, there was a resurgence of the power of the declining hegemon. So the financialization of the 18th century is associated with the Dutch Golden Age, the 19th, late 19th century, and to early 20th century, it's the British Belle Epoque. You know, that it seemed that British power was uh, higher than it had ever been. At that point, the sun never set on the British Empire, etc. And then with the financialization of the late 20th century up to today, that's when we get this US unipolar moment and the people believing that we were on the verge of a uh, second uh, American century. But the, in, in all of these cases, and, I th and, and we've been arguing for some time that also in the US case, that this resurgence is temporary, it's different, it's on shaky foundations, um, that um, to use uh, Bradell's language, it's an autumn rather than a new spring. And so, while well, we know what happened after the British Belle Epoque, um, the, I need, let me, something just hit the down key, somebody. Oh, I just need to. Yeah. I think just, let's see. There we go, yeah. So this is the uh, current account balance uh, that line that goes dramatically down is the United States current account balance. And so we see that in the period of uh, what it was allegedly the major resurgence of US power, it's also when the United States is transformed from being uh, into, well, actually into not only the world's uh, largest debtor, but the largest debtor in world history. So that the path, there's all sorts of reasons why um, this takes place, but in any case, it, there's lots of reasons to think that what we are seeing is, again, the uh, autumn of US world power and the interstitial emergence of something new. I was gonna quote from Marx in Primitive Accumulation about the role of the credit system and financialization and shifting um, resources from declining to rising hegemonic powers, but I'm not gonna do that. Um, and that's that quote there, that's, that goes. Okay, evolution. So, um, I gotta ask for one more. So, um, this is a table that sums up some aspects of the evolutionary pattern. I don't know if, can you see it? No? Okay, never mind then. I will tell you what it says. Um, also, because I'm not going to talk about quite, uh, quite a bit of it. But I'll, so uh, it actually goes, it's showing the change in, in pattern from the uh, Genoese Iberian cycle through the Dutch, the British, and the US. And the first column uh, is about the leading governmental agency. And we have what, what to sum up, just to start by summing up, um, what this chart shows is a pattern of increasing size and complexity uh, in the leading governmental organization of the time. So we move from city-state to national state to, um, to, to the US, which is, uh, so, and Britain, which is more than a national state because it has a global empire, and the US, which, was attempting to, you know, Roosevelt's project was a project of a world state, you, led by the United States, but a world state. Um, and, uh, but then he had to scale it down with the Cold War, and so it became a kind of half of the world state or something. But um, so uh, if, we're, if we're going along a similar path, then, um, and we aren't necessarily, I mean, it's important not, uh, I, I wanna make it clear that we're not suggesting um, that these patterns from, that are reconstructed from the past are deterministic of the future. So, uh, but it means that we have a s several centuries long pattern of increasing size, scale, and complexity, including social complexity. Um, now, 
the world state question, and this was raised by some people already on the panel, uh, is that we're in the midst of a shift, and I've already, and this is sort of where I also started out from here, that if we're in the midst of a, uh, a long-term or a durable shift in the relations between the global north and the global south, then um, this world state, uh, as it was originally conceived, uh, was as a you know, Western-dominated, well, first, you know, Bush is a US-dominated world state, then as a, at least a Western-dominated world state. And I think that was a lot of the hope of Obama, was that Obama would be able to patch up relationships with Europe and then Europe and the U.S. would then be able to reconstruct these um, uh, or world governance organizations that would have a preponderance of uh, Western power, but that's not working. It's, and it's not working uh, because of those big current account surpluses that the U.S. financially um, doesn't have the resources to run a world state. It doesn't have the resources to actually maintain its military over the long run. Uh, not, not, you know, there's also questions about how effective the military has been, even if you have money. But, um, and so if there was to be some form of world state, that it would have to take into, this, into account this changing balance between the global north and the global south. And you see spasmodic, uh, moves in that direction, the whole question of the, the G20, uh, you know, is an attempt to bring together the, uh, finan the financial resources that have now accumulated in the global south with the, um, um, with the military sources that are in the global north, okay? So, and whether this is gonna be successful, is, it's unclear. So, um, here I want to move into, there's, there's lots of things that could be developed here, but I, I want to really make sure that I make um, two points. And uh, one has to do with the role of, of movements. Um, if we look at the evolution over time, from the Genoese to the British to the, um, to the US cycle, that it's clear, uh, I've, I've emphasized um, complexity in terms of governmental organization, complexity in terms of business organization, but there's also uh, been, in the governance organization, increasing social complexity. And the shape of the new world orders that emerge have been recurrently uh, shaped by and influenced by movements from below. And I think this was a point that was made uh, earlier here as well. So although probably um, I'm putting even more emphasis on this. So we can't, without the Haitian Revolution, without the slave revolts of the 19th century, we. Can't, at late 18th, 19th century, we don't understand the nature of British hegemony without the um, national liberation movements and the uh, labor movements and socialist movements of the uh, late 19th and 20th century. We don't understand the nature and uh, conditions and structures of US world hegemony. So as we're looking into what kind of world is going to emerge, I, the role of, of social unrest from below is, has been historically key, and I think that it's going to continue to be key. And then here it's a question of, of where we look. And I think that China, what happens in China is going to be critical to, so the outcome of local struggles in China is gonna be critical to shaping the world order. Uh, globally, and, 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 and not necessarily, there are other alternatives besides this world state. In fact, I don't think it's, I don't, actually don't think it's the most likely uh, path, but I can't really explain why. Um, but it's difficult to understate 
to, to overstate the importance that we have basically um, the, this transitional period, as other people have mentioned this morning, is in, in part made possible by the mobilization of cheap, by, well, first by the destruction of the development project. The destruction of the development project and the import substitution project, national development in the third world, the destruction of that project released a lot of labor that then was mobilized as cheap labor, both for m migration to the core and for, um, and for the production of, ch of cheap commodities, which undergird part of this process of financialization. Uh, so I think we're, we're, everything is pointing to an end of the era of cheap labor. The unrest, uh, China already has a very long tradition of mass social protest. The Chinese government has a long tradition of being very concerned about mass social protest um, and of responding to it. And you can actually see over the last five, 10, you know, since this new government came into power, which I think was 2004, that um, you can see a shift in, in policies within China away from this growth at all costs model more and more toward a model that is emphasizing um, domestic growth, um, moving away from the, the push toward extreme, in, uh, the allowing extreme inequalities to develop to a push toward more guaranteeing livelihood. There's a radicalization of movements from below. Um, and, and that gets me uh, to the final point that I wanted to make. And unfortunately, you can't see this chart. <laughs> I should have figured that out, that you wouldn't be able to see it. But uh, what it, it's, summing, it's summing up a process of increasing internalization of costs. So we first, um, you know, moving from an internalization of protection costs to an internalization of production costs to an internalization of transaction costs. The final column is about the internalization of reproduction costs. And as you go down, it says, no, 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 meaning they're always externalized. And not only are reproduction costs always externalized, but they're externalized on a greater and greater and greater scale. So um, the kind of very resource intensive uh, U.S. model of, uh, of uh, production, you, you know, U.S. center model of production, is, uh, takes the externalization of the cost of reproduction of nature to an extreme. And likewise, this very capital intensive uh, labor expelling model of production also create, has been creating you know, mass unemployment, uh, if you look at it on a global scale, and is an extreme crisis of livelihood if you look at it on a, on a global scale. So um, I think, see if I can make two points very, very quickly. Um, so think back to the overlapping S-curves. And so the obvious question that comes up is are we on the verge of another systemic cycle of accumulation? And, um, and what would be necessary for another systemic cycle of accumulation? And part is um, that I think a key would be to find a way to internalize the cost of reproduction of nature and of human beings. Um, this then harks back to the question, some of the debates yesterday about whether a green capitalism is, is possible. So I think there are three questions to ask about these in, internalization of costs. One, is it, is it theoretically possible? Is it technically possible? And is it politically possible? So my sense, I don't know on the environmental, uh, that it may be theoretically possible, it may be technically possible, I don't know whether it's politically possible, I'm not sure, I'm sort of agnostic, like I don't know whether we can get another 
uh, systemic cycle of accumulation out of green capitalism. But what I do know is that it's theoretically impossible to have uh, an internalization of reproduction costs under capitalism. That capitalism has lived off of some form of externalization. Again, some of the uh, presentations have uh, here have, have raised that. It's lived off of a tight relationship between warfare and capitalist development. And so that to the extent that we have a concern about social justice, redistributive justice, about a world where people have secure livelihood, then that's not a, a world that's gonna come out of another uh, S-curve or, or a possible systemic uh, inter uh, uh, an internalization of reproduction costs under capitalism, and I think that that leads us to be asking all sorts of questions about alternative methods of guaranteeing, guaranteeing livelihood um, for all the people of the world, which was the last sentence of Forces of Labor. That was 2003. I still agree with that. Thank you. Herzlichen Dank an Beverly. Ich empfehle wirklich, äh, da kann man das nochmal nachlesen, Ihren Beitrag äh, in diesem unter anderem von Alex herausgegebenen äh, Büchern äh, vierfach, äh, Vielfachkrise.